Well, it's January and our TV screens and our news feeds are groaning after the excesses of the Christmas season and are now promoting the healthiest way to eat, the way to exercise and how to order our lives as we enter 2023. In our society and in the Bible story, there's often something more going on when we sit down to eat than simply gaining fuel for the next activity. As van der Zee says, a meal is one of the most common yet significant acts of human life. The church family in Corinth in the first century had a bit of a party culture. Some of them certainly enjoyed their food and drink. So much so that celebrating the Lord's Supper had become less than dignified. And the Apostle Paul needs to step in and remind them of their responsibilities to one another and to God. And through his words, we can be challenged as we continue to meet around the Lord's table today. But before we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just a little word about the words we're to use and an observation. I'm going to talk about the Lord's Supper because that is the phrase used in the passage today in our translation. Taking bread and wine together as Jesus instructed to remember his sacrificial death and to celebrate the way made open for us to know God. Now you may hear the words communion, that is sharing in common, or Eucharist, that is thanksgiving used. And these words refer to exactly the same rite, the same action, the same meal. The subject of what, how, why and when we celebrate communion has been a battleground through the history of the church and there is neither time nor appetite to tackle that today, perhaps another time. Today we'll be guided by 1 Corinthians as we are in this series, so come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and beginning at verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Paul wants the church to find, as we've seen in the earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians, their unity in Christ. They are to participate together. They are to be committed to Christ and to follow his commands. You see, with the Lord's Supper, it really is the taking part that counts. Paul writes of the unity of those who come together to share bread and wine, to remember Christ, to give thanks for his sacrifice upon the cross, and in receiving to proclaim good news. We're called as Christians to participate in this meal. In verse 17, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. This meal is an affront to individualism. It's not just about you, or about me. Rather we meet together as those who share in the faith. The overarching phrase for this series of sermons uh, in these terms in 1 Corinthians is a new way of living. That is to say that the message of the letter is about calling the Corinthian church to leave behind their old ideas about their priorities in life, what they should be, and to leave behind the cries of their pagan culture, and to base instead their lives on Christ's priorities. This theme of participation in Christ and participation in worship was a challenge to them and is a challenge to us too. We can so often be selfish when it comes to focusing on our individual relationship with God, our time at church, but we are called to, together, participate, to share with one another the glory of being in relationship with Christ. So they're to participate, but they're also to show their allegiance. Feuerbach in the 19th century wrote, you are what you eat. Now in our eating and drinking the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming our allegiance to him. This section in chapter 10 follows on from what we looked at towards the end of November regarding food sacrifice to idols. So if you've missed that, do have a listen online. Paul is saying, be clear in your allegiance. 
as you meet to eat and drink in celebration of all that Christ has done, don't ascribe too much power to the idols, for they are nothing, but be aware of others' perception. And remember that sacrifices to idols, those things that are nothing more than wood or stone, open people to evil. Those sacrifices are not a neutral activity. So as the people of Israel participated in the altar in verse 18, they connected with the host. And so as we celebrate communion, we participate in Christ. He is the host. And as such, we shouldn't want to worship at any other altar. The communion meal is a reminder to us of God's commitment to us. His giving of his only son to die in our place. And of his call to a heavenly banquet ahead. We're to be committed to Christ. Thistleton writes that a lifestyle that makes commitments that are incompatible with those of the gospel tears apart, or as in chapter 6 verse 5, takes away Christ's limbs and organs. We are to be firm in our allegiance to God and to one another. Then we have a command. Paul, you see, reminds the church in Corinth that they are to be carrying on the tradition that he has taught them. He has received from Jesus in verse 23 of chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is an indispensable part of the mission and ministry of the church. This is one of the few things explicitly commanded by Jesus to his disciples. This command reminds us of the great cost of the meal. It signifies the great celebration that it should elicit. As van der Zee again puts it, Above all, we need to remember that each celebration was not just a Last Supper remembrance with its overtones of grief and pain, but a meal with the risen Lord who promises to be present with us by his Spirit and unites us with his ascended and glorious new humanity. But it wouldn't be a sermon from the book of 1 Corinthians if we didn't come across some issues that were happening in the Corinthian church. There are some things where Paul speaks and he is responding to particular questions. And here in this passage, it seems that he has heard a report, an eyewitness account from someone who's been to a service at the church in Corinth. How severe is verse 17 of chapter 11? I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. You see, the worship of the Corinthian church was so far away from the joyful celebration with all those who had faith in Christ that Paul goes as far as to say as it is actually doing more harm than good. We'll look later in this series at some of the other issues going on in the worship life of the Corinthian church. But here there are at least two issues that Paul wants to tackle. One is selfishness and the other is unworthy reception. So firstly, selfishness. One of the main reasons for the trouble here in Corinth was their selfishness. They'd not let the power of the gospel impact every area of their life. They were living the same way as others around them in regards to how they viewed others. They loved status. Now the church in Corinth was meeting together for worship and the Lord's Supper, the supper being uh, the context of a larger meal, not the separated small piece of bread and cup of wine uh, that we have today. But as they met in the houses of those amongst them with large enough houses, for, to accommodate the church, there was a separation, as there would have been in normal society. The meal started 
they started before all the guests were there. The rich and the powerful were drinking and eating to excess, and the slaves and the workers, those who had jobs and duties to attend to, well, before they got to the celebration, they found that by the time they arrived, there was little left. So in verse 21, we hear one remains hungry, another gets drunk. Rather than waiting and including everyone, those who were there first helped themselves. Then there's unworthy reception. I won't pretend that these verses are easy to deal with, but come down to verse 27 of chapter 11. Preparing to come and worship God with our brothers and sisters in Christ should be preceded by a time of preparation, of examination, so that one does not approach God in an unworthy manner. It's one of the reasons we include a prayer of confession so early on in our services every time we meet. We know that a way has been made for us to be in relationship with God through the death of Christ. That is done. But we need to remember that pattern of repentance and faith that should characterise our lives as believers. Not recognising the body of the Lord is perhaps not recognising that this meal of the Lord's Supper is... Actually, it's not just another meal in the cycle of feeding. Rather, there is to be spiritual preparation and more intentional care taking over this sharing together. And Paul goes as far to say, uh, in Leon Morris's words, that spiritual ills may have physical results. Not that all illness is as because of this, but because some of the Corinthians have found themselves badly affected from their cavalier attitude to corporate worship. We might not see that link today, but we need to be aware of the choices that we make spiritually that they may impact on the rest of our lives. So what's going on today? Are we so far removed from the problems of the church in Corinth uh, that actually this is just a history lesson and it doesn't really matter? Well no, we learn in these passages a great deal about our responsibilities to one another as the family of God in the context of our worship and our witness. We need to heed the challenges that the problems that the Corinthians bring up. So what would Paul write to us? What would Paul write to us? Might he say, you are what you eat. This simple meal, bread and wine, is a guard against intellectualism and a guard against asceticism. This is a way of communing, of remembering, of participating, of wrestling our faith from purely intellectual assent or simply heavenly mindedness. And it roots it in everyday experience, sight, smell, touch and taste. How easy is it for us in the enlightened West to see our faith as intellectual or as a feeling? But very real bread and very real wine remind us of the physical nature of Christ's sacrifice as well as his spiritual victory. Our faith is to be connected with all of life. Our remembering, our celebrating is meant to be all-encompassing. And for us that can be uncomfortable. For if faith impacts everything, not just my thoughts about God, but also how I spend my time, my money, who I eat with, then that won't let faith just be a private thing. Communion is not just about me and God, you and God, either from the traditional perspective or from a more charismatic experience focused perspective. This meal is meant to find its home in community. Now the dynamics of a communion service mean that it can be intensely personal as we come in times of great desperation or great celebration, but it is in a profoundly corporate setting, for this is something we do as the church. As we celebrate together, we look back, we look around, we look forward 
the meal remembers the last supper of Jesus, his giving of himself, the breaking of his body and spilling of his blood, so that new covenant relationship between us and God could be established. The meal establishes us as a community bound together in Christ. We are one in Christ, for we all share. The focus then is not simply on the past, but on how the wonder of Christ's death and resurrection transforms the present. The meal that proclaims that Christ is Lord as we receive tokens of his love for us, as we spiritually feed on him, as we admit our need of him, as we receive bread and wine and say Amen, we're saying, yes, I agree. We proclaim in the narrative of God's loving rescue, which is what we repeat in the prayer before we share communion, the good news that Christ is Lord. And finally, this meal waits, for this is not a permanent feature of all eternity. We eat and drink this meal until Christ comes again. For then we will celebrate with the saints of all the ages, with members of the Corinthian church, with all those of every tribe and tongue and nation who have put their faith in Jesus. Then we will celebrate the wedding feast of the Lamb, a heavenly banquet. So to Christ, our help and our food for the journey of faith, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, be all the worship, all the praise, all the thanks, all the glory, now and forever. Amen.